on November 15th. James, thank you very much for coming back on the program. How are you? I'm fine, Albert. Thank you. Uh, thanks for inviting me. Great to be with you. It's always great to speak with you. Uh, thanks to your people and your publisher, I have a copy right here of the new book, uh, which, uh, as I mentioned on the intro, launches November 15th. I noticed it's already one of the best sellers on Amazon.com in pre-order. And uh, as I was joking with you before we rolled, Jim, uh, I am a slow reader. So usually it's a challenge for me to get through a book before it goes out of print. Thanks to you, I've actually finished a book before it, it launches. And I have to say that I, I think, this is my opinion, that this is your best book yet. Uh, and one of the reasons is because I don't think there's anyone else who could have written this book. Uh, you have a unique perspective. You have a unique background. And not only is it unique, it's very relevant to what's going on today. Uh, so can you tell me uh, first, how does this book fit in uh, to the series that you're, that you're writing now? Well, first of all, Albert, thank you. And um, thank you for the kind words about the book. Uh, you're right. The, uh, you know, there are different ways to buy the book. You can do Barnes & Noble, Amazon, uh, independent booksellers. But Amazon has rankings, and they have numerous subcategories. There's you know, the overall books, but they have a category called money and monetary policy. And we're, we're number one in that category, but we're competing with books that are already in the bookstore. So we're even the pre-sale is competing with books, as I said, that have already been published out in the bookstores, and we're number one. Very, very grateful for that, and I thank uh, all the all the uh, the folks who are interested in it. Um, the The Road to Ruin is actually volume three of a projected quartet, uh, four book series, starting with Currency Wars, The Death of Money, The Road to Ruin, and then down the road there'll be another book, but that's not that's something for uh, for 2018. We can talk about that later. But Road to Ruin is volume three. Um, Really following, uh, if it just is a meta theme, the, the four horsemen of the apocalypse, if you will. Think of it as the, the four horsemen of the financial apocalypse. So this is volume three, the black horse. I talk about that in the book a little bit. Uh, but the, uh, but metaphors aside, uh, it's a continuation of a study of the future of the international monetary system. What's different about this book, Currency Wars and the Death of Money, in different ways, uh, talked about the instability in the system, warned you about the coming crisis, provided a lot of historical background and some science ways to think about it. This book has some of that, but it also, instead of warning you about the crisis, it puts you in the crisis. It says, hey, the crisis is here. What will the reaction function of the global elites be? What is their plan to deal with the crisis? What specific steps will they take? How does it affect you as an investor? So I really put you inside the crisis. And to do this as a device, I look at three crises, uh, 1998, 2008, and then keeping with the 10-year tempo, 2018. So a uh, projected crisis. And by the way, I'm not putting a hard stake in the ground saying, you know, 2018, like clockwork, we're going to have a crisis. Uh, the truth is it could happen tomorrow. Uh, there's no reason why uh, why it has to be, uh, you know, two years out. But that's a, a reasonable estimate, but something that investors should be prepared about, uh, prepared for uh, uh, tomorrow. But I'm using 2018 to keep up this 10-year tempo. Now, what happened in 1998? That was the Russia long-term capital meltdown. Um, a lot of investors remember it. Uh, I was very involved in that personally. I was the General Counsel of Long-Term Capital Management, which was the hedge fund that was in the eye of the storm. I negotiated that bailout by Wall Street. Um, and we came hours away from closing every stock and bond market in the world. That's how bad it would have been. Uh, and that's not an exaggeration. Uh, Alan Greenspan, chairman of the Fed at the time, Bob Rubin, secretary of the Treasury at the time, both testified to that effect. And as I say, I was in the room with the Treasury, with the Fed, with the major banks, uh, financial leaders around the world, a lot of lawyers running around when we actually did the closing. And uh, we were we were desperate to get it done before Tokyo opened that morning. And then later that day, September 29th, the Fed cut interest rates, cut them again at an emergency meeting. You know, we kind of foamed the runways, brought the plane in for a landing and uh, didn't blow up the world, but came extremely close. 2008, same thing. We were days away from the sequential collapse of every bank in the world. So Bear Stearns failed in March 2008, then Fannie and Freddie in uh, June, July 2008, then Lehman in September 2008. They were falling like dominoes one after the other. After Lehman, it would have been uh, Morgan Stanley, then Goldman Sachs, then Citi, B of A, JP Morgan. They all would have fallen except that the Fed stepped in and truncated that process. And this is an important distinction between a man-made complex system such as capital markets and a natural complex system such as a seismic zone or an earthquake, in other words. Um, 
they have the same dynamics, the same math. Uh, this, the complexity theory describes both of them. I explain all this in the book. The difference is that in a natural system, let's say a seismic zone, when an earthquake starts, you can't stop it. The earthquake has to just run its course. You can't stop it. But, but when a financial earthquake starts, you can stop it by truncating it with intervention. But the problem is, imagine hypothetically you could stop an earthquake in the middle. You can't do it, but imagine you could. All of that energy would be stored up. An earthquake is just the release of energy. If you stopped it, hypothetically, the energy wouldn't go away. It would just be stored up for the future. Same thing in a financial earthquake. You can truncate it with policy, but you don't solve the problem. That financial energy is stored up waiting for the next earthquake, and it's coming soon. Now, how did the Fed actually do this in 2008? They did a couple things. You know, we know over time they increased their balance sheet from $800 billion to $4 trillion. That's $3.2 trillion of new money printing. But they did a lot more than that. They did a swap agreement with the European Central Bank where they printed $10 trillion. This was not known at the time. It came out a few years later, partly as a result of Dodd-Frank. But what was going on, Albert, was that the European commercial banks lent money in dollars, and they had to borrow in dollars to fund those loans. A lot of those borrowings came from the commercial paper market, bank CDs, short-term paper. Americans were panicked. They were pulling their money out of the uh, money market funds. So those money market funds couldn't roll over the bank IOUs. So the European banks turned to their central bank. The European central bank is lender of last resort. But there was one problem. The European central bank prints euros, but it can't print dollars. And they were desperate for dollars. So what happened was the European central bank printed up a bunch of euros. The Federal Reserve printed up a bunch of dollars. They swapped them. And that gave the European Central Bank the dollars they needed to bail out their own banking system. In addition to that, the Fed and the FDIC together, they guaranteed every bank deposit in America, regardless of insurance size. So insurance at the time was $250,000. They they gave them unlimited. So if you had a million dollars, you were a small business, had a million dollars of working capital in your account, that got guaranteed unlimited size. They also guaranteed every money market fund in America. And there was no legal obligation to do that, uh, but they went ahead and did it anyway. So that was the extent to which uh, the pa they, they truncated the panic. Now come forward to 2018. None of the problems have been solved. The biggest banks, uh, the, the so-called too big to fail banks today, they're bigger. They have a larger percentage of the banking assets. They have much larger derivatives books. All this financial energy, as I call it, has been stored up waiting for the next earthquake. It's just a matter of time. But here's the difference. The best description of a financial panic I've ever heard is that everybody wants their money back. You know, you see people, they say, well, I've got money in the stock market, money in the bond market, et cetera. I say, no, you don't. You have stocks and bonds but you don't have money. If you want money, you've got to sell the stocks and bonds, probably the worst possible time, and try to get your money if you can. So in 1998, everybody wanted their money back. The Fed printed the money and gave it to them. In 2008, everybody wanted their money back. The Fed printed the money and gave it to them. In 2018, everybody's going to want their money back. By the way, if not sooner than 2018, the difference is you're not going to get your money back. They can't do it again. They're at the outer limit. They have not normalized their balance sheets. What they're going to do is lock down the system. They're going to, uh, money market funds are going to suspend redemptions. Banks will be closed. ATMs will be reprogrammed so you can only get, say, $300 a day for gas and groceries. Stock exchanges will be closed. Instead of printing the money and giving it to you, they're going to say you can't get your money. Now, by the way, they'll, they'll say it's temporary, right, temporary until the IMF can ride to the rescue with, you know, trillions of SDRs. That's their world money, the special drawing rights. Um, I did this, but remember, in, in August uh, 1971, Richard Nixon said he was suspending the gold standard temporarily. Those were his words 45 years ago. That still has not been reversed. But um, so, that, so that's what's happening. Uh, that's what's going to happen. And I talk about all this in the book in, in great detail. Uh, James, you talk about all of that in the book. And I actually love the analogy of uh, uh, market crashes and earthquakes. I, I kind of liken it to a compressed spring. Uh, they can push the pause button on it, uh, but they can't, uh, they got to dissipate that energy. So you talk about that, and that is certainly yeah, not a rosy scenario. But uh, I want to I wanna augment uh, what you just said, because you know they say like, don't judge a book by its cover. And so I think that's the case here. And don't get the wrong idea. I love the, the, the title. It's catchy title, great artwork. But this is not a typical doomsday uh, story. I th this is a real thoughtful uh, look at the evolution of the world financial system, 
the evolution of uh, American politics and culture, and and sort of uh, set in in, uh, in the broad view of Western civilization. And uh, you know, reading it was just just a joy. Looking through the notes and the sources here, um, if I ever got to meet your wife, I'd like to ask her. D does James read a lot? Not because I don't know the answer, but because I'd love to see the look on her face. Uh, you look at these sources. Uh, this is not an exhaustive list, uh, but here in the sources you have, uh, you know, the Journal of Business, okay. The Journal of Atmospheric Sciences. Uh, <laughs> uh, the American Journal of Physics. You have uh, Eugen uh, von Bauwerk. I, I think it's his PhD dissertation. A lot of other uh, notable economists here. You really do your homework, and uh, no one can uh, uh, accuse you of tunnel vision here because you really take into a lot when you do this. Well, well thank you, Albert, and uh, that, that's important to me, and I hope the readers uh, enjoy it and appreciate it, but I don't like to make claims, and I never make claims without providing backup. Now, there are a lot of people running around, they'll say, you know, gold's going to $5,000, the world's coming to an end, the system's going to collapse, etc. I might even agree, but if, if you just make the claim, and don't back it up with something. It can be history, it can be science, it can be um, psychology, it can be you know, mathematics. It can be a lot of things. I actually use all of them um, because I'm not really interested in debating claims. I am interested in debating the an the analysis behind it. That's To me, that's where the meat is. And so uh, it's about a 300-page book. There are 151 footnotes, uh, then uh, many more, you know, as you point out, sources and articles uh, that I use. So um, so the claims are there. The, the forecast is there. But uh, it's all backed up. And uh, what I want to do is, as I say, you know, debate the analysis. If you disagree with the analysis, that's fine. I, I welcome disagreement. I learn from it. Uh, I'm happy to have those debates, but I'm not really interested in debating claims. I, I like all the backup, and it is uh, all in the book. The other thing uh, I try hard to do is um, put it in plain English. Now, that's not the same as dumbing it down. Nothing is dumbed down. Uh, the, the book uh, an analyzes things at hopefully a very high level. But if you use a little plain English, some metaphors, some stories, it makes it very accessible to the reader. There are some equations in there, but you don't have to wrestle those to the ground. I mean, they're there for those who want to do it, but you can just sort of flow through it and, and see the analysis. And so uh, hopefully that um, that comes through for the reader, uh, and uh, I wouldn't, wouldn't have it any other way. I'd like to put that back up in there in addition to uh, stating my forecast. Right. Uh, and, uh, you know, one of the things that comes up over and over again uh, not just in your book, but uh, you know, critics of the Fed and what's going on now, is the modeling. The modeling is very poor. And uh, you know, von Mises wrote that if you want to attack a thesis, you can attack the reasoning or you can attack the assumptions. The reasoning is usually pretty good because these people are very smart, but the assumptions are just horrendous. And uh, so you attack the models that they use, the stochastics, the idea of normal distributions, uh, the uh, the idea of you know no memory in the system, and that's what leads you to complexity uh, theory. Can you talk about the idea that you know price movements are not a random walk? There's feedback, there's memory, there's agents. There's several times I was reading this book, I had to put it down. And I thought finally someone is saying this, someone gets it. Uh, talk about that. Just the memory in the system, how how people. Uh, their decisions are, are, are correlated and related to what they've seen in the near past. Sure, Albert. There's a, there's a, a list of assumptions, I think it's a good way to put it, that are the foundation, the, the actual bedrock of modern financial theory. And by the way, it, it takes a while for things to percolate out of the university into the markets and then finally into, let's call it popular culture or wider understanding. That process can take 30 or 40 or 50 years. You know, we all credit Charles Darwin with the theory of evolution and that's fine, it was his theory, but it was really Thomas Huxley years later who popularized it and kind of put it into public discourse. So so that, that, that does take a, a, a matter of time. When I was at long-term capital management, we had 16 PhDs on our executive committee, on our, our risk management committee, uh, all from you know MIT, Harvard, Stanford, Chicago. I call them the usual suspects. Uh, two of them were Nobel Prize winners in the kind of theories we're talking about: Myron Scholes and Robert C. Merton. The others were equally prominent, really the fathers, if you will, of modern financial theory in some ways. So I got I got marinated in this. I got steeped in this, and I understood it very well. And after the long-term capital fiasco, I looked back and said. 
there's something wrong here. I mean, they, they these guys were not dumb. They're not bad people. They're they're you know friends of mine. Uh, they're very smart people. But I said if they got it this badly wrong, there must be something wrong with the modeling. And I went back and I spent ten years studying physics, statistics, applied mathematics, graph theory, network theory, behavioral psychology, et cetera, uh, all those sources that you talk about in the book to figure out what it, what it is. Now, the assumptions are markets are efficient, which means they incorporate all information in real time that you can't beat the market because the market knows everything you know uh, and, and you can't kind of get ahead of that too. Risk is normally distributed. Normally distributed means, you know, if I flip a coin, a uh, hundred times, I'm going to get about 50 heads and 50 tails. Yeah, it might be, you know, 49 heads and 51 tails or 48, 52, but it's not going to be 20, 80. I'm not going to get 20 heads and 80 tails. The odds of that are almost infinitesimal. So those those extreme events, those extreme distributions don't happen, that the, that over time it comes very close to that 50, 50 outcome. And that's what you, that's what you, when you were saying there's no memory, you know, each coin, coin toss is independent. So, you know, if I flip three heads in a row, a lot of people say, huh, you have three heads in a row, next one's got to be tails, false. I mean, that, that really is 50, 50. Uh, that's called the gambler's fallacy, by the way. Well, that is true of coin tosses. It is true of you know, rolls of the dice. It's not true of capital markets. Capital markets do have memory. So markets are not efficient. They're, they're very inefficient. They, uh, they're, they're, they're subject to all kinds of cognitive biases. Cognitive biases are just the, the mental maps that we have that, that prejudice the way we think about things. Uh, they, do have, they do have memory, which is what happens next is not random or it's not 50-50. It's conditioned on what we say is path dependent. Well, once you get into the world of finance and capital markets and begin to look at it with the correct models instead of the incorrect models, understand that uh, capital markets are not an equilibrium system. Risk is not uh, randomly uh, or normally distributed, um, you know, et cetera, and understand how things really work. You can get much better results in your forecasting. So I do two things. Number one, I criticize and uh, the the existing models. And by the way, if you have the wrong model, you're going to get the policy wrong every single time. Um, and there's, let me give you a very simple example. So I have a pen in my hand right here. So I'm holding it up, and uh, I say, "Okay, Albert, I want you to you know give me a forecast. I'm going to let go of the pen. What's going to happen to the pen?" And uh, you'll say, "Jim, it's going to hit the uh, it's hit, it's going to hit your desk." And so I let go. And it hits the desk. Well, did you have a crystal ball? I mean, how did you know the future? Well, you knew it because uh, you had a mental model. You know what gravity is. You, we're not on the moon. Uh, you know, this pen has weight. And you know that if I let go, it's going to hit the desk every single time. So you have the correct mental model. But Janet Yellen has a model that says if I let go, it's going to float up to the sky. So as I say, getting the right model, getting the model right is critical. And that's what I uh, take readers through in the book. Once you do that, once you use complexity theory, uh, something called Bayes' theorem, behavioral psychology, uh, and a couple other uh, branches of science, once you do that and start to look at capital markets, they look very different. And you can actually see uh, disasters coming. You can see the inefficiencies. You have, and I guess, not that you have a crystal ball. It's that you have a better model. And if you do that, you can say the pen's going to hit the desk. And you can say that capital markets are, are heading into the worst financial crisis in history. Yeah, and I don't claim to be an expert in any of that. Uh, I have a, you know, some understanding, especially of probability theories and math. But I can tell you that it's a much better starting point from where I stand than uh, these <laughs> statistical-based uh, models. Now, I want to ask you something. This goes to your unique uh, perspective. Uh, you've dealt with people on the academic side and on the finance side, and what strikes me is uh, in academia, uh, they seem to, it's like they have no memory, and it's very, it's very strange. Oh, one, one comment about the coin. I, I love the description uh, of the coin. You know, there are no contrarian coins, meaning the guy who looks back, the coin doesn't look back and see three heads and, and right. flip tails. Uh, right. He doesn't have a, a stake in it. But um, uh, LTCM. Is a, is a great example, and I appreciate you dedicating a, a big portion of a chapter to that to get your insider's perspective. Um, you know, if, if a hedge fund blows up, and when those partners go off and they start a new one, maybe they start a new one, maybe they don't. But the market looks at them differently. I, I bet that, uh, you know, these guys who are smart guys, but if they go off and start another hedge fund, they're going to take haircuts, not like before. 
uh, that French bank, whether it's SockGen or PMB, I forget which one, they're going to hedge their position <laughs> with right. them. The market learns, right? The market penalizes failure and the market learns. But these central bankers and academics just go on as if nothing happened. Is, is, does that amaze you? It, it does in a way. I mean, they don't suffer any penalties. The, the faith in central bankers seems to be unlimited. Uh, you know, uh, Jim Grant, I'm a big admirer of Jim Grant. He talks about this uh, a lot. He said, we're not on the gold standard. We're on the Ph.D. standard. Uh, and actually, you saw it, uh, you know, as recently as uh, when we're conducting this interview. You know, there's a big debate about Mark Carney leaving his role as the governor of the Bank of England because of the Brexit failure, et cetera. Uh, and it was, you know, the market was up today because Carney agreed to stay for another year. It's like, oh, he's got the same wrong models as the rest of these guys. But the mere fact that he agreed to sign on for another year is supposed to, or two years rather, is supposed to make the market rally. I mean, this is unlimited faith in a small group of individuals. And by the way, Albert, I've, I've met a lot of them. I've spoken one-on-one -on -one with Ben Bernanke. I've spoken to members of the Board of Governors, Regional Reserve Bank presidents, academics. I had dinner uh, recently, as a few days ago, with uh, Bill Dudley, probably the second most powerful central banker in the world after Janet Yellen, uh, you know, uh, vice chairman of the Federal Open Market Committee, CEO of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. Uh, so I've had occasion to meet a lot of these individuals and in one-on-one -on -one settings. Uh, they're all nice people. They're all smart. I haven't met too many jerks, but boy, do they not get it. When I talk to them about what we're discussing right now, it, the response is interesting. They they can't process it. It's not even as if they say, well, Jim, I disagree with that or let's debate that or whatever. They're just, they can't even begin to internalize it or process it, which is a little frightening. But uh, but interestingly, um, Janet Yellen gave a speech uh, a couple of weeks ago. It was her most recent speech uh, to uh, to a group in Boston. It's you know it's on the Federal Reserve website. You can you can find it pretty easily. Uh, and she used the the technical name for what we're talking about, which is hysteresis. I, we don't have to get too involved in the jargon, but hysteresis is, is the academic jargon for market memory, meaning things are not working the way. The stochastic models would indicate that there's there's there are impediments, behavioral structural impediments. I thought that was interesting. She didn't sign on to it, but her speech was, you know, here are five things I wish economists would do. She was basically setting out research projects, saying, hey, I want all you younger economists and you staff economists to to go out and figure this stuff out because we don't seem to know what we're doing. It was very technical, but it was kind of a candid admission by Janet Yellen that she doesn't know what she's doing. And by the way, members of the Board of Governors have said that to me privately. They don't say it publicly, at least not very often, but in private conversations, they say, Jim, we don't know what we're doing. We we try something. If it works, we do more. If it doesn't work, we back off. We try something else. Bernanke described this to me as an experiment. He said, he said, 30 years from now, some future scholar will look back and figure out if we got it right, but we actually don't know right now uh, if this stuff works, if QE works. I find all this stuff amazing. You think if the, if the general public understood that we are guinea pigs in a PhD experiment, uh, that that is what's going on. That's what they said to me privately. Well, anyway, Yellen kind of tiptoed up to this and said, uh, "Here are all the things we don't get. You know, does the Phillips curve still work? Do markets have memory?" She used the word hysteresis, but that's what it means. Uh, so maybe there's a little bit of awareness, but we're still very far from them getting it. Meanwhile, we're not very far from the next crisis. So when it hits. The reaction function is going to be what I describe in the book, which is they're not going to give you your money back. They're going to lock down the system. And people need to prepare today for that eventuality. They need to get, first of all, some non-digital assets independent of the market crash. There's a war going on right now between Russia and the United States. It looks like World War III to me. It's being fought in cyberspace. It's not kinetic. We're not dropping bombs on each other. Um, but we are dropping digital bombs on each other. Uh, you see it in these airline outages, these stock exchange outages. You see signs of it everywhere. Um, you know, very well documented. This is not speculation or or, or futurism. This is uh, stuff that's going on today. And you know, I occasionally bump into billionaires, and you ask them what they have, and they go, "I have stocks and I have bonds and so forth." And I say, "No, you don't. You have electrons." Those electrons can be hacked, they can be erased, they can disappear overnight. Good luck finding them. Uh, if you don't have some tangible assets, I'm not saying 100%, but gold, silver, fine art, land, natural resources, or even if you're in security space, private equity, venture capital, where it's a, it's a written contract with someone you know and you've backed uh, his or her company, uh, that's a far cry from having everything in digital space, but I don't help people sleep at night without that. So so that's a separate threat, in addition to just the system collapsing, which I, we described, 
the separate threat of a digital wipeout is out there too. Between the two, uh, it's a very dangerous world. I'm not trying, you know, people sometimes accuse me of scaring people. I, I go, no, they're already scared. What I'm trying to do is shed some light on it, help people to understand it. Um, and, and then you can sort of function a little bit better if you have a better understanding of it. So that's what we uh, try to do in the book. James, uh, we're running short on time, but I want to hit you up on quick, two quick points. And by the way, he goes through uh, all of those techniques in the books in terms of uh, putting together a portfolio. And uh, he talks about uh, ways to secure generational wealth as opposed to sh short-term wealth. But uh, there's two points I wanted to hit. Uh, we talked about the academics. And you, you've uh, admitted in your own experience you think that they don't get it. I want to talk about the bankers and the people on Wall Street because I think they do get it. And, I'll, and, I'll, uh, and this is to do with value at risk. And I'll, I'll give you a, an analogy. I know your kids are, are older than mine, but I think kids um, don't figure out the Santa Claus game as early as they're capable of, meaning they could figure out it earlier than they, than they do, but the game is just too good. Okay, so they keep it going. And I think the bankers, I think that they know that these models don't work, but these models allow them to hold less capital and increase their earnings. What, what do you think? Do you think that, uh, that they actually buy into it? Because this, these rules also allow them to generate their own proprietary models. Sure. So uh, it's, it's a great game for them. Yeah, the, the answer, Albert, and I know a lot of bankers, some of them get it, some of them don't. Now, for example, Jamie Dimon in the last, uh, his last you know, CEO letter to investors on JP Morgan's annual report for uh, 2015, um, embarrassed himself. He was he was trying to explain away the London whale fiasco. Remember, they lost billions of dollars on that trade. And nobody in the bank really understood it. One guy, uh, actually, the next CEO of J.P. Morgan was one of my associates at Long Term Capital. His name is Matt Zames, uh, and Matty was the guy that they turned to in the middle of the London whale. Said, "Can you figure this out?" And he did. But nobody else in the bank, uh, Ina Drew, uh, Jamie Dimon, uh, no one up and down the chain of command understood what was going on. But anyway. Diamond in his letter says, you know, we lost this money, but it was the event was so rare, so unusual. It was sort of one time since uh, in the last three billion years. That was the frequency. I said, really? One time in the last three billion years? You must be a very unlucky bank to have that happen to you. Of course, what he was saying is that he thought it was normally distributed, and that was the, the rarity uh, or the infrequency of the event. But, of course, when you understand that risk is not normally distributed, that these extreme events happen with great frequency, uh, then it, was, it wasn't that surprising at all. So Diamond was revealing uh, sort of his own ignorance of how things actually work, a little scary since he's the CEO of one of the world's largest and most important banks. But some of them do get it. You get down in the ranks, uh, they, they look at that, they understand the flaws. There's a lot of academic literature in this. I'm not the only one who's pointed this out. But they have a vested interest in keeping the game going, exactly as you described, Albert, because when you use the wrong model, uh, it, it allows you to use more leverage. It makes the system look safer than it actually is. Now, the regulators are uh, hypnotized by all this, right? They don't get it either. Um, but the bankers say, hey, we've got all these models, meet our PhDs, meet our quants, look at our systems, check them out. They bring in accounting firms to audit them, et cetera. And they go, yeah, all good. And the regulators say, yeah, all good. And they're all in it together. But those who understand the flaws have no interest in pointing them out because the incorrect model lets you use more leverage. What does that mean? You can make more money in the short run. Now, you're going to lose more money in the long run. But you can make more money in the short run with more leverage. There's no, that's not you know, magic. That's not hard to figure out. So what does that mean? They get big bonuses. They take the money. By the way, what do they do with the money? They put it into other stuff. They're getting out of the system. They're buying gold. They're buying the kinds of things I talk about in the book, right? They're like, hey, just give me one big bonus check or two or whatever. Let me get out of here. If it all collapses and the little guy gets crushed, the everyday investor gets crushed, and the taxpayer has to bail me out, that's on them. So this is pure greed. Uh, pure short-termism, so it's a mixture. Some of it's ignorance, some of it is greed. Neither one of those things is very attractive. I'm trying to shed light on all that, and actually I've met with regulators. I've been invited down for private briefings at the Office of Financial Research and uh, the Financial Stability Oversight uh, Committee in, uh, in the Treasury uh, to brief them on this, but they don't seem to get it. I mean, you know, I thank them for their time and thank them for inviting me, but uh, one of the scariest things I ever heard was the people in the Treasury who are responsible for this said, oh, we leave it to the Fed. I was like, really? I've spoken to the Fed. They don't get it either. So 
Uh, there's, there's just a lot of bad motives, uh, bad science floating around. All I'm saying is like, I can't change the world, but I can alert investors to what we're talking about. And you, you, may, you may not be able to save the system, but you can save your family, save your net worth, save your hard-earned savings uh, by uh, sort of uh, following uh, what's in the book and just understanding it. Quickly, uh, James, um, we talked about, about the banks. In the book, you talk about global leverage continuing to rise. Uh, but if you look at the banks themselves, they've sort of cleaned things up a little bit. And uh, there was another point where I put down the book and said, wow, this guy gets it. You said, look, these banks, uh, ultimately, they're going to be told by the Fed or Treasury that they've got to buy whatever's out there and they're going to do it. That's been my feeling all along. They're like Thanksgiving turkeys just you know, a month before Thanksgiving getting fatter and fatter, but they're getting ready to carved up, uh, get carved up. I think, uh, as you mentioned, if you work in a bank, and you're getting salary bonuses, that might be okay. You might even be able to lend to a bank, but I don't think you want to own banks right now. What's your feeling on that? Well, um, I agree with that. I mean, they're, they're, uh, they are too big to fail. They're not going away. Deutsche Bank is a good example, you know, very much in the eye of the storm right now. Uh, I, wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't own Deutsche Bank stock at these levels. In fact, uh, it, it's an interesting opportunity to you know, profit from the short side. Uh, here's the thing. The German government is organizing a bailout of, of Deutsche Bank. Now, they've gotten rid of bail bailouts. Bailouts are when you use taxpayer money to prop up the balance sheet. That's no longer the deal. As of the uh, November 2014 Brisbane, Australia G20 summit, working papers go through all that I have, uh, the new deal is bail-in. Uh, bail-in is when you, you know, depositors take haircuts, bondholders take haircuts, stock gets wiped out, et cetera. So they're you know, work, you know, working the order and they'll call who the, who's the big money in the world, you know, Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund, Abu Dhabi Investment Authority, Kuwait Investment Authority, CIC in China. These guys write the big checks. They're looking at this. You know, they got suckered in 2008 by Hank Paulson. They came in and bailed out the U.S. banking system. They lost 95 percent of their money by, uh, within a year. Uh, by the time the panic hit in 2008. So they're sitting there saying, okay, we'll buy Deutsche Bank stock at one euro per share. Why should we buy it at 10 euros per share when it's all going to get wiped out? We're not suckers. And so that has a lot further to fall. That panic's going to get more acute. So it's a little bit of a game going on um, with governments that, that won't bail out the banks. They will uh, bail them in. They'd rather get outside money, but the outside money wised up because they got suckered in 2008. And so you're going to see a lot more stress, a lot more kind of ugly headlines. Uh, and then this is just one bank. Let's hope it doesn't turn into contagion and spread throughout the world. But uh, when it gets bad enough, they will lock down the system. All right. Thank you very much. I know you got to run. So please, uh, please go out and get this book, uh, The Road to Ruin. Check out James at uh, jamesrickardsproject.com and on Twitter at James. G. Rickards. Thank you very much, James. I really appreciate it. Look forward to talking to you again soon. Thanks, Albert. And don't forget to visit powerandmarket.com for insightful interviews with the world's leading experts in economics, finance, and investing. Till next time, take care. Hi, I'm Albert Liu, host of the Power and Market Report. If you enjoyed money, if you want money, you've got to sell the stocks and bonds, probably the worst possible time, and try to get your money if you can. So in 1998, everybody wanted their money back. The Fed printed the money and gave it to them. In 2008, everybody wanted their money back. The Fed printed the money and gave it to them. In 2018, everybody's going to want their money back. By the way, if not sooner than 2018, the difference is you're not going to get your money back. They can't do it again. They're at the outer limit. They have not normalized their balance sheets. What they're going to do is lock down the system. They're going to, uh, money market funds are going to suspend redemptions. Banks will be closed. ATMs will be reprogrammed so you can only get, say, $300 a day for gas and groceries. Stock exchanges will be closed. Instead of printing the money and giving it to you, they're going to say you can't get your money. Now, by the way, they'll, they'll say it's temporary, right, temporary until the IMF can ride to the rescue with, you know, trillions of SDRs. That's their world money, the special drawing rights. Um, and this, but remember, in, in August uh, 1971, Richard Nixon said he was suspending the gold standard temporarily. Those were his words 45 years ago. That still has not been reversed. But um, so, that, so that's what's happening. Uh, that's what's going to happen. And I talk about all this in the book in, in great detail. Uh, James, you talk about all of that in the book. And I actually love the analogy of uh, uh, market crashes and earthquakes. I, I kind of liken it to a compressed spring. Uh, they can push the pause button on it, uh, but they can't, uh, they got to dissipate that energy. So you talk about that, and that is certainly yeah, not a rosy scenario. 
but uh, I want to I want to augment uh, what you just said because you know they say like don't judge a book by its cover and so I think that's the case here and don't get the wrong idea I love the the, the title it's catchy title great artwork but this is not a typical doomsday uh, story I th this is a real thoughtful uh, look at the, the theme, the the four horsemen of the apocalypse, if you will. Think of it as the the four horsemen of the financial apocalypse. So this is volume three, the black horse. I talk about that in the book a little bit. Uh, but the um, but metaphors aside, uh, it's a continuation of a study of the future of the international monetary system. What's different about this book, Currency Wars and the Death of Money, in different ways? Uh, talked about the instability in the system, warned you about the coming crisis, provided a lot of historical background and some science ways to think about it. This book has some of that, but it also, instead of warning you about the crisis, it puts you in the crisis. It says, hey, the crisis is here. What will the reaction function of the global elites be? What is their plan to deal with the crisis? What specific steps will they take? How does it affect you as an investor? So I really put you inside the crisis. And to do this as a device, I look at three crises uh, 1998, 2008, and then keeping with the 10 year tempo, 2018. So, uh, projected crisis. And by the way, I, I'm not putting a hard stake in the ground saying, you know, 2018, like clockwork, we're going to have a crisis. Uh, the truth is, it could happen tomorrow. Uh, there's no reason why, uh, why it has to be, uh, you know, two years out. But that's a, a reasonable estimate, but something that investors should be prepared about, uh, prepared for, uh, uh, tomorrow, but I'm using 2018 to keep up this 10 year tempo. Now, what happened in 1998? That was the Russia long term capital meltdown. Um, a lot of investors remember it. Uh, I was very involved in that personally. I was the general counsel of long term capital management, which was the hedge fund that was in the eye of the storm. I negotiated that bailout by Wall Street. Um, and we came hours away from closing every stock and bond market in the world. That's how bad it would have been. Uh, and that's not an exaggeration. Uh, Alan Greenspan, chairman of the Fed at the time, Bob Rubin, secretary of the Treasury at the time, both testified to that effect. And as I say, I was in the room with the Treasury, with the Fed, with the major banks, uh, financial leaders around the world, a lot of lawyers running around when we actually did the closing. And uh, we were we were desperate to get it done before Tokyo opened that morning. And then later that day, September 29th, the Fed cut interest rates, cut them again at an emergency meeting. You know, we kind of foamed the runways, brought the plane in for a landing and uh, didn't blow up the world, but came extremely close. 2008, same thing. We were days away from the sequential collapse of every bank in the world. So Bear Stearns failed in March 2008, then Fannie and Freddie in uh, June, July 2008, then Lehman in September 2008. They were falling like dominoes one after the other. After Lehman, it would have been uh, Morgan Stanley, then Goldman Sachs, then Citi, B of A, JP Morgan. They all would have fallen except that the Fed stepped in and truncated that process. And this is an important distinction between a man-made complex system such as capital markets and a natural complex system such as a seismic zone or an, or an earthquake, in other words. Um, they have the same dynamics, the same math. Uh, this, the complexity theory describes both of them. I explain all this in the book. The difference is that in a natural system, let's say a seismic zone, when an earthquake starts, you can't stop it. The earthquake has to just run its course. You can't stop it. But, but when a financial earthquake starts, you can stop it by truncating it with intervention. But the problem is, imagine hypothetically you could stop an earthquake in the middle. You can't do it, but imagine you could. All of that energy would be stored up. An earthquake is just the release of energy. If you stopped it hypothetically, the energy wouldn't go away. It would just be stored up for the future. Same thing in a financial earthquake. You can truncate it with policy, but you don't solve the problem that financial energy is stored up waiting for the next earthquake and it's coming soon. Now, how did the Fed actually do this in 2008? They did a couple of things. You know, we know over time they increased their balance sheet from $800 billion to $4 trillion. That's $3.2 trillion of new money. On November 15th, James, thank you very much for coming back on the program. How are you? I'm fine, Albert. Thank you. Uh, thanks for inviting me. Great to be with you. It's always great to speak with you. Uh, thanks to your people and your publisher, I have a copy right here of the new book, uh, which, uh, as I mentioned on the intro, launches November 15th. I noticed it's already one of the best sellers on Amazon.com in pre-order. And uh, as I was joking with you before we rolled, Jim, uh, I am a slow reader. So usually it's a challenge for me to get through a book before it goes out of print. Thanks to you, I've actually finished a book before it, it launches. 
And I have to say that I, I think, this is my opinion, that this is your best book yet. Uh, and one of the reasons is because I don't think there's anyone else who could have written this book. Uh, you have a unique perspective. You have a unique background. And not only is it unique, it's very relevant to what's going on today. Uh, so can you tell me uh, first, how does this book fit in uh, to the series that you're, that you're writing now? Well, first of all, Albert, thank you. And um, thank you for the kind words about the book. Uh, you're right. The, uh, you know, there are different ways to buy the book. You can do Barnes & Noble, Amazon, uh, independent booksellers. But Amazon has rankings, and they have numerous subcategories. There's you know, the overall books, but they have a category called money and monetary policy. And we're, we're number one in that category, but we're competing with books that are already in the bookstore. So we're even the pre-sale is competing with books, as I said, that have already been published out in the bookstores, and we're number one. Very, very grateful for that, and I thank uh, all the all the uh, the folks who are interested in it. Um, the The Road to Ruin is actually volume three of a projected quartet, uh, four book series, starting with Currency Wars, The Death of Money, The Road to Ruin, and then down the road there'll be another book, but that's not that's something for uh, for 2018. We can talk about that later. But Road to Ruin is volume three. Um, really following uh if it just is a meta but they did a lot more than that they did a swap agreement with the european central bank where they printed 10 trillion dollars this was not known at the time it came out a few years later partly as a result of dodd frank but what was going on albert was that the european commercial banks lent money in dollars and they had to borrow in dollars to fund those loans a lot of those borrowings came from the commercial paper market bank cds short-term paper Americans were panicked. They were pulling their money out of the uh, money market funds. So those money market funds couldn't roll over the bank IOUs. So the European banks turned to their central bank. The European central bank is lender of last resort. But there was one problem. The European central bank prints euros, but it can't print dollars. And they were desperate for dollars. So what happened was the European central bank printed up a bunch of euros. The Federal Reserve printed up a bunch of dollars. They swapped them. And that gave the European Central Bank the dollars they needed to bail out their own banking system. In addition to that, the Fed and the FDIC together, they guaranteed every bank deposit in America, regardless of insurance size. So insurance at the time was $250,000. They they gave them unlimited. So if you had a million dollars, you were a small business, had a million dollars of working capital in your account, that got guaranteed unlimited size. They also guaranteed every money market fund in America. And there was no legal obligation to do that. Uh, but they went ahead and did it anyway. So that was the extent to which uh, the pa they, they truncated the panic. Now come forward to 2018. None of the problems have been solved. The biggest banks, uh, the, the so-called too big to fail banks today, they're bigger. They have a larger percentage of the banking assets. They have much larger derivatives books. All this financial energy, as I call it, has been stored up, waiting for the next earthquake. It's just a matter of time. But here's the difference. The best description of a financial panic I've ever heard is that everybody wants their money back. You know, you see people, they say, well, I've got money in the stock market, money in the bond market, et cetera. I say, no, you don't. You have stocks and bonds, but you don't have money.